Um, first of all, I should apologise that I'm not from Logan. Um, <laughs> I've never apologised for that we before. Can make you an, we can make you an honor, honorary member if you like. <laughs> Maybe one day. I have been to Logan and I've been through it. Now look, my topic is weight loss surgery um, and some of the dilemmas and you know, the obvious one in one slide is the access to weight loss surgery. Some reference has already been made by some of the administrators uh, speaking previous today. Um, and look, sometimes in Queensland Health, surprise, surprise, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is actually doing. Um, we do do publicly funded weight loss surgery at the Royal Brisbane Hospital. We've been doing it for 15 years. I have a clinic. All I do at the Royal Brisbane Hospital is weight loss surgery and weight related surgery. Um, we have a clinic, an outpatient clinic that only deals with weight loss surgery and um, it's a pretty big deal. Now, the comment is that bariatric surgery or weight loss surgery in the last 15 years really has gone from the periphery to the centre. Meaning that um, in the late 90s when I was doing my subspecialty training, a lot of the, my senior surgeons wanted to know what I was doing delving into weight loss surgery and I was kind of saying, guys, I think this is a really big deal and has to be taken very seriously. And I also decided in about 2001 that surgeons shouldn't really dabble in weight loss surgery. I don't quite understand the concept of doing one or two a month. Um, I think smaller numbers, like we know in every form of surgery, high volume centres will probably get better outcomes. Um, and look, we don't really have to worry about volume, it's, it's the reverse in weight loss surgery. Volume, may, moderating the volume tends to be the issue. Um, it's still fair to say, unfortunately, that um, not all clinicians think that this is fair and reasonable. Um, the reality is that there is still a certain bias, a certain stigma. It's okay to be jaundiced against an overweight patient because they probably bought it upon themselves. Um, similarly, um, I've had a variety of internists at the Royal Brisbane uh, in various ways attempt to obstruct us in the last 15 years. Um, I've just really kept my head down and been entirely sure that I'm on the right track and we keep going. And look, most of even those clinicians now uh, can see that it probably has its role. And in fact, it's quite bizarre that in the one sentence people can say to you, I don't really believe in this surgery, but there's a patient I'd really like you to see. Um, it, it is, I, I kid you not, they will do that. I'm not really into this, but my patient has a particular need. That's what I always find kind of special. It is also you know, the community backing. I mean, I've, the only time I've ever rung into 612 Radio uh, National was when they were having a discussion on weight loss surgery and whether it should be back, funded by the public purse. Now look, the reality is if anyone who does understand how private practice works as well, Medicare is funding that as well. So it's insane to suggest that we're having a new discussion on whether the public purse should fund bariatric surgery. It does. Um, but again, this was not six months ago on Radio National that they were still having the discussion, should we or shouldn't we? And it's bizarre how everybody has an opinion and it's usually based on not a whole lot of correct information. The media can be spectacularly unhelpful, as they can in all aspects of medicine. I almost think they shouldn't be allowed to do it. There is no 30 second news grab that can get it right. Um, and they will say, insinuating things like, Dr Hopkins, what do you say to people who say that you know, they bought it upon themselves and the public shouldn't pay? You sort of say, well, if you could show me who they were, um, I would answer them. Um, it's just media grab stuff and I find it, 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 it's usually counterproductive, sorry. Now, I understand the concept that people want to know why weight loss surgery because the maths of weight loss is really bizarrely simple. Reduce the caloric intake, you will reduce the weight. Now just back to basics, it's not about exercise, I'm not into bagging exercise, but exercise is not good for weight loss. If you want to improve your weight loss, you dramatically reduce what's going in. Exercise is good for you, it is not good for weight loss. So this is a standard Jenny Craig 60,000 plus clients. It does work, we know it works, but that is the follow-up rate. It doesn't work. We know it doesn't work because people won't follow it. Now again, I am an upper GI surgeon. I'm actually not a sociologist, I'm not an obesity expert per se. I'm an upper GI surgeon, I know my way around three and a half feet of proximal small gut. But anybody can tell that it, that doesn't work. And it's kind of interesting that we will sometimes insist 
that people try to do something that we know doesn't work before we will give them access to something that we know does. And in fact, in the NHMRC guidelines, they insist children do it three times before they get access, or adolescents, to weight loss surgery. In other words, you have to try something three times that we know doesn't work before you're allowed to have access to weight loss surgery. It's really quite bizarre. The Magda Skabansky business model. She failed her Jenny Craig or whatever it was, and they still use her on the advertisements because she went back for more. It's just the non-negotiably fantastic business model. They advertise their failure because she went back for more. Um, it's really quite bizarre, and it is a huge industry. Now, Shakespeare nailed it 400 years ago. Desperate diseases grown by desperate appliances are relieved. I lob out about 15 stomachs a week. Sometimes it moves up to 30 stomachs a week. It never ceases to amaze me what I'm doing to these people in the name of weight loss. And to all the surgeons in the room, I'm constantly reminding our trainees and our associates that we've got a perfectly well 31-year-old lady, mother of three, and I'm about to take nine-tenths of her stomach out. It is a really big deal. Oddly enough, we can do it faster now than most people can take a gallbladder out or in the theatre beside me this morning, remove some earwax from an ear. <laughs> but that took longer than my sleeve. Much longer, actually. Um, so there does remain a dilemma that what we're doing in the private practice is not necessarily reflected in the public practice. And really, I wanted to make this the focus, um, even though I wasn't entirely sure who my audience would be today, um, the focus of the conversation. Um, how do we bring the dilemma into the public hospital? Because in short, the sleeve gastrectomy and variations of it are second only to gallbladder surgery and interabdominal surgery, more than colons. And it's only really done in the public, in the private sector, sorry, so uh, teaching people. Uh, trainees learning to do these operations, it becomes terribly difficult. I have a private bariatric fellow now, and they, in fact, do do the private work with me. They do do the primary operating. There is no other way we can teach this stuff. Um, at the Royal Brisbane Hospital, I'm allowed to do as much as I can get done, but I have two operating lists, uh, a for one a fortnight, and it goes for six to seven hours, and the turnover and the, you know, the guys that I've worked with all know the usual story. We, we don't get that much work done. Um, it always reminds me of the Premier's Obesity Summit, Peter Beatty, back in 2005. Was anyone at that summit? Oh, I'm the only one left. Okay. All we do to talk, we talk quite a lot about Peter Beatty's weight, and I thought that was really interesting. It's all about him. Um, we got so little achieved, it was outstanding. Everything that has been discussed in this room today was discussed in 2005 and how the public institutions needed to start taking it a bit more seriously. And surprise, surprise, absolutely nothing happened. I joined three committees as a result of that summit. Um, I will never join a committee again. Now, this is how most surgeons feel when they wake up in the morning and they're ready for their big day, but this is the outcome that scares the BGBs out of us. Again, I'm just bringing you back to basics, that this is major GI surgery with major GI potential pr problems. So I want to talk to you just a little bit about, because some of the part was me updating on what exactly is going on out there. This is the old-fashioned VBG. Now, a lot of this was done in the 80s, and a lot of this is still haunting us in surgical clinics today. These patients from the 80s have absolutely no idea what happened to them. They just say, I had an operation in the 80s, it worked for a while and then it stopped working. And just about every senior surgeon in the country, and I'm talking senior over the age of 60, at one stage in the 80s, dabble with this stuff. Again, it was what surgeons tended to do whilst waiting for their real practice to take off. Just about every breast surgeon, every colorectal surgeon, every general surgeon tried a few of these in the 80s. So there's still a lot of this stuff um, coming. I mean, I, I would still see one of these a week. Um, this is the classic Ruwai gastric bypass, which is, in my opinion, the gold standard procedure. Um, this is the gastric band, which, uh, for those interested in the different nuances, I've gone from doing hundreds of these a year to none. Um, basically because of that uh, case study that was just presented. Um, 
the problem with the band is its revision rate and its failure rate, and it began to saturate it, so I've moved away from that. This is the sleeve gastrectomy, which is currently the most common operation done um, by surgeons in this country. And even though I think it's wrong, I think this should be the most common operation. And some of the surgeons in the room have heard me bore other uh, lecture theatres with this data. But just to give you the basics, there's the shadow of what the stomach should look like. Now, basic surgical anatomy, guys, the stomach only expands in one direction, the greater curve. The food pipe, the lesser curve, and the pylorus are all fixed. The stomach expands massively, but only in one, or actually in three directions over this way. In a sleeve gastrectomy, we're taking nine-tenths of the stomach, but we're only taking the greater curve and the body and the fundus of the stomach. And look, it is an A to B operation. I understand why it's popular both with patients as well as with surgeons, because they can kind of understand it. If Mother Nature was to redesign our plumbing for weight loss, it probably wouldn't be with an artificial prosthetic device. And to be honest, it probably wouldn't be with a, a gastric bypass. It would be some version of this. And maybe in a few millennia, that's what our bodies will go back to. But just back to basics, somebody asked the question a little bit earlier. I think it was Kevin on the nine hormones that make us eat and the one hormone that restricts us. Now, in my opinion, the reason why this works, or all weight loss surgery works when it controls the appetite. There is no point in restricting someone, and this is actually where the band falls over, in my opinion. I always have to say in my opinion, because other people give me grief otherwise. Um, if you have something that is very restricting and you can hardly eat anything, but you're starving, you will find out a way to beat it. So that lady from Logan who was sucking down the high caloric fluids to keep herself awake, my point is she would have been hungry as well. If you don't control the appetite, you do not control the weight. Every person in the world knows that the Jenny Craig formula works. It doesn't work because you don't control the appetite and sooner or later they fall off the wagon. When we do this operation for at least two or three years, you get a dramatic reduction in your appetite. People are confused. They're so without appetite. They can walk up to a buffet and walk past it. As I say to them, you don't stop eating because Jenny Craig told you, because your dietitian told you, because Dr. Hopkins told you. You stop eating because you're disinterested. One and a half mouthfuls of food in a pouch that estimates should be about 60 mils between the top and the, the emptying portion. That's about three mouthfuls of food and you will stop because you are disinterested in eating anymore. If you control the appetite, and to be honest, I think that's where most of the medical uh, aspect kick, kicks in to, to help us. But um, again, these things eventually will fail as well. So again, 10 years ago, it used to be this argument, we don't need allied health, we just need surgery. And the surgeons and the allied health would say, we don't need surgery, we just need good allied health and proper behavioral modification. What I would say to you is the answer is non-negotiably both. A, a proper weight loss surgical outfit cannot do it without the allied health, and it's now called integrated health for those who are interested. Apparently the name changed a year ago. Integrated health, dietitians, psychologists, exercise physiologists. What I say to my patients now is with whatever variety of operation we choose to do, we will bring your weight down. It will almost certainly never go down as far as we want it to. It will then plateau, and then one of three things will happen it will go a little bit lower, it'll stay the same, or it'll go back up. And most people, if you are not in, involved in your integrated health, it will go back up, because we know the gut has a fabulous ability to adapt. I mean, even when we do total gastrectomies on people for cancer, if they live long enough from the cancer, they will get a very good functional result. The gut will adapt. The neo-rectums that the colorectal boys use, when they get good at it, um, they get terrific results with continence, even though they do not have a rectum. So we know the gut will adapt to what we're doing to it. We are offering people a second opportunity to get their weight down, and then the, with the help of the integrated health and whoever the health they need in their life, they will then work out how to modify their behaviour to prevent it from happening again. How long have I got? And how long have I got? 15. 20. 20. Okay. Um, I make this comment and I've made it a couple of times already, we need to be better surgeons for what we're doing. My point being that if you ever go to an oncology surgical morbidity and mortality meeting and 
someone presents an esophagectomy or a Whipple's pancreatic ojordanectomy, which got complicated, went to ICU and then died, pretty much no one in the room will mutter, you know, a thing. Probably, yeah, that's a difficult case, that. Yeah, cancer kills people. Anyway, next case. Try doing that with a sleeve gastrectomy. 14, one-year-old lady, mother of three, came in to have her sleeve gastrectomy, and this happened, this happened, and then she died. It is a totally and utterly unacceptable outcome from major GI surgery. And I agree, it's a totally and utterly unacceptable outcome. But the reality is, with the volumes being done, and I touch on this because we're at the quasim meeting, um, there will be bariatric mortalities. So my theme is that I think we have to be better surgeons than our oncology associates because our mortalities are simply unacceptable. Um, I'm not going to give you the slides on the prevalence. I want to just pop back to the realities of trying to work out what we can do in a public hospital um, weight loss clinic. This is the first dilemma. Sepsis and cancer will always trump weight loss surgery. So if you have an ICU bed block, if you have limited space in your theater, if the surgeon, this is actually one of the reasons I had to take a step back from cancer surgery. I initially, I still am in the HPB unit, but I would never be able to get a weight loss procedure done if a cancer was waiting on my waiting list. It just wasn't rational. So I had to take a step back, but the reality remained that if someone's sick on the ward from whatever, or if somebody has cancer from whatever, as a general rule, I had to surrender that space. And it remains an ongoing bed blocking issue. The issues of teaching responsibilities. Last week we did a sleeve gastrectomy, which um, the fellows did, and it took approximately two and a half hours. Now, that is almost certainly uh, a case that I could have done in less than an hour, and we could have got two cases done. Um, what's the right thing to do? I, I don't know. I wait there, I watch there, I encourage them to hurry the hell up. But there are teaching responsibilities. And they're similar with the, the anaesthetist. Why don't we let the fellow put the uh, art line in? And, you know, you're sitting there tapping. Why don't we not let the fellow put the art line in? Um, you know, we really don't have all day, guys. This is the really big bug there in my public clinic, is the revision versus the primary. I now do more revisional procedures than I do primary procedures because of the volume of those 80s VBGs and the banding issues from the 90s and 10 years ago. There's a huge volume of people with complicated band issues which are very symptomatic, not usually deadly, but pretty miserable, that need to be rejigged. So I try very hard to keep the primaries coming because, of course, they're the good teaching models. Revision surgery is by definition higher risk and more complicated and usually requires um, our direct involvement rather than leaving it to the, you know, they're not junior surgeons, but the, the, the not senior surgeons. We have the mean BMI of my private practice is 43, the mean BMI of our public practice is 55. Nothing would surprise um, the guys from Logan about that. It is a very different beast in the, in the public hospital system. This becomes the really big deal to me, um, how sick is too sick? I mean, there's been a lot of conversations on the side with me about this institution, the PA, getting their weight loss surgery up and running. And their initial plan was that we'll all go through their medical weight loss program, and that would be really cool. You had to go through the medical program to get to the surgical program. And what that ends up dissing up to the surgeons is the s most severe comorbidity-written patients who are probably the least valued outcomes that we're going to get. If someone has got end-stage diabetes, end-stage obstructive sleep apnea with the pulmonary hypertension, the whole bit, that is probably not the patient you want to start your weight loss surgical clinic with. So I had to talk to the surgeons and say, you have to say to the physicians, no, that is not where we're starting our weight loss surgery clinic. The best people to get, are in fact, are the people just before they start getting sick with all the morbidities that we know about. Getting the super obese, the super sick, and the super, uh, you know, failure. Like, I have a rule. If someone can't walk, they can't have an operation. That's a really simple rule. Um, but there's a variety of those little key markers which sort of, it, it, it's discriminatory, I give you. I was asked in a conference in New Zealand, what's my age limit? And I said I get nervous over the age of 70. Again, I get nervous about whether it's worthwhile. I mean, it can be done. There's no question it can be done. 
um, but I was accused from the back of the room of being ageist and that it's against the law in New Zealand and if I said that again out loud, she would make a fuss. Um, I thought that was pretty interesting. So, I mean, again, it is ageist. I'm saying to you that I'm not too sure that we get value. So, back to the topic, and I'll finish with this slide. So, I've mentioned this, the too big, that's an obvious one. This one is the really big component of weight loss surgery at the moment. The lower BMI patient coming for weight loss surgery. The people with BMIs 31 to 35 saying to me, you did my sister a year ago, she's lost 60 kilograms, she's now lighter than me, what do I have to do? Do I actually have to put on weight to satisfy your criteria to have weight loss surgery? Mm. It's actually not that funny. That is exactly what they are saying. You tell me, Doc, how many kilograms I need to put on before you will deal with this. This is the biggest single concern I've got in weight loss surgery at the moment because, again, these people can die. And if I had to keep reminding these people, this is not like having your appendix out and your gallbladder out. You can die having this operation. Yes, doctor, but the ballpark is it's a 1 in 600, 1 in 1,000 death rate. My sister went really well. I will have it, thanks. So I've gone from seeing one of them or two of them every few months to seeing handfuls a week of people with lower BMIs saying, I'm sick of living like this. I want the change. We've mentioned the too old. I'll take you back to the obvious too young. Um, again, I think treatment delayed is treatment denied. I've done 13-year-olds for sleeve gastrectomies. I won't put a band on. It's a safer operation, but it's an operation to a 13-year-old who is guaranteed revisional surgery in the future, and it's going to make very difficult any more definitive surgery down the track. But we are getting inundated by the adolescent population as well. And again, I don't think that saying to a 14 or 15-year-old, 150-kilogram girl, that just hang in there for a few more years while your social life, your professional opportunities and your self-esteem goes down the toilet and then we'll fix you up when you're 17, 18, 19. So I, I cannot see the defensibility of saying to an adolescent, you're too young. Um, we've touched on the too sick, that is where they're end stage and probably gone too far. And the other one is, well, sorry, the too difficult. Um, these are the people who have had potentially multiple previous surgeries, whether it be weight loss surgery or other gastrointestinal surgery, but which just make them technically incredibly difficult, which makes the surgery either one, high risk, or two, even when you do get through the risk, they often tend to be less effective. I'm often reminding my patients that weight loss surgery is not like having your hair cut. You do a bit, you go back and take a little bit more, and you go back and take a little bit more, and you just keep doing that. I think when you get to about the third revisional operation, you usually have to say stop. Um, the risk is going through the roof, the yield is going down, and again, that's a huge part of the, the public hospital dilemma, where people with all sorts of issues uh, and procedures done in the 80s and 90s are coming and saying, I want one last crack. So look, I will leave it at that. Um, take any questions. Th thanks, George, for those fascinating insights into the life and thought processes of a bariatric surgeon. Um, any questions? They want to see you. They want to see an orthopedic surgeon for their hip or their knee, and they're morbidly obese. Could you elaborate on that situation, please? Um, look, I try very hard. If someone is due to, you know, Margie. Brooke, who spoke to you earlier, um, she's one of the dietitians in our group, and I asked her to make particular mention of the, our preoperative weight loss program. I work very hard at trying to get the colleagues in my non-general surgical, the, the, the orthopods, the spinal guys, uh, particularly the fertility guys, are just starting to get figure it out at the moment. Um, pre uh, medical weight loss in a very short, sharp term, and that's what the intensive program is about. It's not long term setting dates, there's your orthopaedic procedure, it's due in 10 weeks, we're going to spend six of the next 10 weeks reducing your weight. That we know we can get it down 10, 15, 16 percent and they will get a better perioperative outcome. Now look, again, there's different things. If someone's going to have their knee done with a BMI of 60 with over 200 kilograms, I would suggest to them, why don't we back up a little bit here. But 
I, I try very hard not to get in the way of the other procedures. I would be telling them you need a medical assistance into this operation that you need. Um, and look, the, the allied health guys can sort that out. Um, I've got a, a, a huge sort of inclination to stay out of that. Um, let the allied health guys do their best. They can do terrific work over a short, sharp period of time. They just can't do it in a durable fashion. It will never be durable. Thanks, George. Um, Matthew, our orthopaedic surgeon, might touch on that area as well. But we might move on to the next speaker. And thank you very much, George.